Well, thank you very much for um, having me today. Um, I'd like to spend the next 30 or so minutes talking, sort of giving you an idea of the size of the, pro of the problem um, and proposing a few solutions, but mostly just, you know, kind of aiding you to size the um, housing crisis in the U.S. Um, as you can see from this slide, the value of the U.S. housing market is about $16.7 trillion. The mortgage market is $10.3 trillion. Out of the $10.3 trillion mortgage market, a little bit over half of it, or $5.4 trillion, is agency mortgage-backed securities. Unsecuritized first liens at commercial banks, savings institutions, credit unions, and the Freddie and Fannie portfolio is just under $3 trillion. The private label universe is about $1.1 trillion, and second liens are just under $900 million. So again, that $10.3 trillion is a little bit over half um, agency debt, um, with the balance being made up by unsecuritized first liens, um, in the bank, primarily in the banking system, the private label universe, and second liens. When you look at, secu at, secure, at, at origination volumes, recent origination volumes, it's a very different story. Again, agency MBS was a little bit over half of the total universe. However, when you look at what's been, at recent activity, agency MBS is over 90% of all 2011 origination. That is, out of 2011 origination, about 69% went toward GSE securitization, that is, Freddie and Fannie securitization. Another 22% went toward FHA VA securitization for a total of a little bit over 90%. Um, bank portfolio origination, which is that light blue line at the top part of this, is about 9.6%. And as you all know, the private label market is almost entirely missing. We all know the private label market. There's been very little private label activity since um, 2007. But I think what's really interesting here is to realize you know, that this has become almost totally a government market. And look at the contraction in terms of bank portfolio origination. If you go back to 2001, bank portfolio origination was about 36% of the total. It's now under 10%. So basically, the um, private money has left the mortgage market almost entirely, um, and it has become almost entirely a government market. Now let's actually move to the condition of the outstanding housing market. And what we're going to do is we're going to divide our universe of homes into five different groups. Non-performing loans, that is borrowers that are more than 60 days past due. Re-performing loans, these are loans that um, used to be more than 60 or more days past due, but have been brought current or 30 days past due due to either a modification or a self-cure, and most of those are modifications. And then we've got three categories of always performing loans. Greater than 120 mark-to-market loan-to-value, 100 to 120, and less than 100. And we've divided these groups into, by mark-to-market, loan-to-value, because um, Loan to value is the single most important determinant of default. Um, so higher LTV loans, even if they're currently paying, have a much higher probability of default. Now let's, what, we're, what we want to do is take each of these groups and put reasonable default probabilities on them. Now obviously this is an, this is an assumption driven exercise because we really don't know what defaults on, this group, on each of these groups are going to be. Um, this is a worse housing crisis than we even had in the Great Depression. So this is all very, very speculative. I'm going to give you my numbers, and I'm going to give you the intuition as to how I got there. And you know, you're f you're perfectly free to substitute your own numbers. But even once, you, but even if you use very, very conservative numbers, we can see that we that the housing crisis has a long way to go. We figure in our base case, our bottom line is that there's somewhere between 7.2 and 9.2 million units. Still, that are going to end up liquidating if things go, go the way they are. Compare that, and you can see this um, on the bottom part, on the um, 
right hand side of the picture. You can see that thus far since 2007 we've liquidated about 4.6 million homes with somewhere between 7.2 and 9.2 million left to go. So let me motivate that 7.2 to 9.2 million. Let's start with the non-performing loans. There are 4.2 million borrowers in the U.S. that haven't made a payment, that are at least two payments behind on their mortgage. Now how how likely are these borrowers to default? Well, one thing we can do is we can look at how borrowers just like them two years ago have performed. Basically, what we did is we looked at the non-performing population two years ago, that is the borrowers that were 60 or more days past due two years ago, did a Facebook lookup on each one. Hey. Um, where are you now? The equivalent of looking up old flames at the inter on the internet at midnight, which of course none of us have ever done. Non-performing loans 24 months ago, 35.1% have been liquidated, 45% remain non-performing, 19.8% are re-performing, and 0.1% are voluntarily prepaid. So of the mortgages that were non-performing 24 months ago, 19.9% of them are alive in some way, shape, or form, and some of those will eventually default. So as you can see in the bottom part of this slide, we're gonna use an 80 to 90% eventual default rate for, these bu for this bucket. Now, what do we do about re-performing loans? That is, those 3.9 million borrowers, who have, many of whom have received a modification. If you look at this slide, this shows you the transition rates of re-performers, that is, the rate at which these re-performers are re-defaulting. And you can see they're re-defaulting at around 40%. Per annum. Um, now, if they're re if they're redefaulting at 40 percent per annum, and they're voluntarily prepaying at 3 percent per annum, and if you don't default this year, you get another chance to do it again next year. That would suggest they're all going to default. But in fact, we know that that's wrong because if you look, because once you've paid for a while, you're much more likely to continue to pay. So why don't we do this? So when we do the same type of exercise, which is on the bottom part of this slide, we look at the re-performing loans. 24 months ago, hey, where are you now? You can see that 5.4% have been liquidated, 32% are, are, are non-performing, 60% are re-performing, and 2.2% are voluntarily prepaid. So of the re-performing loans 24 months ago, 62.3% of them are alive, that is 38% have eventually have already died. We're going to assume for this group a 40 to 55 percent eventual death rate. Um, now let's look at our always performing borrowers. Now remember, an always performing borrower is one that has never been two payments behind. We have this divided into LTV groups because, as you can see here. Loan to value is the single most important determinant of both prepays and defaults. So if you look um, on this slide, you can see that a prime borrower less than 100 LT, prime fixed borrower less than 100 LTV in a private label security, securitization is prepaying around 25% per annum, the blue line. He's defaulting or going 60 plus for the first time at around 3% per annum. If you look at a prime borrower 101 to 120 loan to value, that borrower is prepaying around 10% per annum, and he's going 60 plus for the first time at around 8% per annum. A borrower with an LTV ratio greater than 120 is prepaying around 4% and going 60 plus for the first time at around 12%. So just um, you know, a huge relationship. Loan to value is the single most important determinant of both defaults and prepayments. So let's actually consider what the eventual probability of default is for each of these groups of borrowers. Let's first look at always performing loans greater than 120 mark to market loan to value. 2.1 million borrowers. Um, the 
these borrowers are going 60 plus for the first time at around 11.9, call it 12% per annum, where it says three months CTR. They're voluntarily prepaying at around 8% per annum for the universe as a whole. That gives you uh, the ratio of defaults to defaults plus prepays is around 60%. That is, borrowers rarely pay on schedule all the way to maturity. Usually they either default or prepay. So this would suggest they have a 60% probability of defaulting. But in fact, we know that tr those transition rates are going to burn out. So we assume the eventual default rate on this bucket is 20 to 35%. Now let's do the same analysis for 100 to 120 mark to market loan to value. 4.6 million borrowers. These borrowers are going 60 plus for the first time at 6.5% per annum. They're voluntarily prepaying at 12.4% per annum. If nothing changes, 34%, 35% of those borrowers eventually gonna, are eventually going to default. We're going to use a 10 to 15% default rate for this bucket. Now let's look at always performing loans less than 100 mark to market loan to value. 36.8 million units. These borrowers are going 60 plus for the first time at 2.2% per annum. They're voluntarily prepaying at 21% per annum. If nothing changes, 9.4% of these borrowers eventually default. We're going to use a 4 to 5% default rate for this bucket. Now you're probably wondering, how can you use a 4 to 5 percent default rate for borrowers who have never before missed two payments, who have less than 100 mark to market loan to value? Remember, less than 100 mark to market loan to value does not mean they have equity in their home. You can have a borrower who has a 95 loan to value and has a second mortgage, so he has a 125 combined loan to value. And because I can't match up my first and second liens um, for loans outside of private label space, I'm going to pick him up in that bottom bucket. And so some of those borrowers in that bottom bucket do not actually have equity in their homes. So if you add up all my numbers, what you find is that there's somewhere between 7.2 and 9.2 million homes in, in jeopardy of default. That is, we've liquidated 4.7 with somewhere between 7.2 and 9.2 million homes to go. That just sort of gives you an order of ma an idea of the order of magnitude of this problem. Now you're thinking, okay, so you've got this huge number of homes that are going to liquidate over some undefined period of time. What is sort of the near-term problem? So I'm going to define shadow inventory very, very narrowly here as borrowers who haven't made a payment in their in their home in over a year or are in foreclosure. There are 2.9 million borrowers who haven't made a payment in over a year who are in foreclosure. That is, out of that 4.4 million non-performing borrowers, 2.8 million of them haven't made a payment in over a year or in foreclosure. There are another approximately 400,000 loans in REO. So altogether, we're looking at 3.2 to 3.3 million units. We're selling about 86,000 distressed units per month, giving us about 38 months of overhang, just looking at the distressed properties where the borrower hasn't made a payment in over a year. Now let's think about the supply-demand gap. Um, and I'm going to make you a case that we need both a more successful modification program and we need to do bulk sales. So what I want to do is first give you an idea of how big the supply-demand gap is. Let's use my 7.2 to 9.2 million units that we've already talked about. And let's assume that these borrowers are at risk of default over the next six years. Obviously, this is very assumption dependent, and the six years, like everything else, was an assumption, but it seems pretty reasonable. Um, so that gives you somewhere between 1.2 and 1.5 distressed units per year. Add to that about a half a million units of new construction, which um, gels almost exactly with the number that Manuel presented to you earlier. That gives you somewhere between 1.7 and 2 million units in terms of annual supply. 
In terms of demographics, we're assuming 600, um, in terms of housing demand, three components. First, about 600,000 units due to demographics. That is, there's broad agreement that housing formation should be about 1.2 million units per year over the next decade. And I'm going to assume a 50% home ownership rate for that population because out of that 1.2 million units, about 400,000 are going to be, are, um, are going to represent it, are, are immigration, are represented by immigrants. Another, and you've got a huge, and the echo boom, which is um, mostly aging into this group, has a huge amount of student loans. Plus, I think there's been a very subtle change in terms of people's views toward home ownership. My generation saw home, saw home ownership as a store of value. My kids, my, um, kids see it as a lawn to mow. So that's going to result in eventually lower home ownership rate. So I'm going to use 50% home ownership rate for this group. The actual home ownership rate right now in the U.S. is about 66%. If you take out, and we're going, to, we're going to talk a little bit more about this later, but if you take out those 2.8 million borrowers who haven't made a payment in over a year and therefore shouldn't be considered homeowners, the actual number is 63.8%. So I'm haircutting it a little bit to get my 50% home ownership rate. 400,000 due to obsolescence. That's been running around 250,000, but you're going to but people trash their homes on the way out. And about 200,000 second home purchases. That gives you 1.2 million units in annual demand or a supply demand gap of somewhere between a half a million and two thirds of a million units a year or three to five million units over the next six years over the next six years. The paradox of this market is we've got this huge supply demand gap that can't be filled by owner occupants and I'm going to argue that there's a huge role for investors. But, but at the same time affordability is at a 20-year high. Case Shiller, uh, the S&P Case Shiller home price depreciation has been 34 percent since the peak. Primary mortgage rates are at the lowest level since the 1960s. The result of that is the Housing Affordability Composite Index. That is the um, ability of the median family to buy the median priced home, putting down 25, um, putting down a 20% down payment and taking out a 30-year fixed rate mortgage um, at prevailing interest rates is, looks as good as it has in a generation. Just to put this in perspective, 100 represents 25% of your income. So again, the Housing Affordability Composite Index is, at an, is basically at an all-time high since the National Association of Realtors started keeping this data. So why does, why does housing look so weak? Uh, the MBA Composite Purchase Index, which measures mortgage application activity, is at roughly a 15-year low. U.S. existing home sales, everyone's cheering the fact that it's up a little bit. Yes, it's up a little bit, but it looks um, pretty bad in any sort of reasonable historical framework. And new U.S. new one-family home sales is at lower levels than it was in the 1960s. So altogether, the housing market it, um, remains very much in the doldrums, despite the fact that affordability is at a 20-year is at a 20-year high. I'm going to make you the case now that the supply demand function for housing is fundamentally broken. First, 19% of 2007 borrowers can't qualify for a new mortgage simply because their old their home has been liquidated or they reach 90 days delinquent on their old mortgage. So they basically ruin their credit rating. Um, so that's, that's basically 19% of 2007 borrowers. In addition, both GSE and bank portfolio credit is very, very tight. For 2009 through 2011, your average GSE loan was a 68 loan to value ratio, a 762 FICO. For bank portfolio loans, the numbers were not much different. 67 loan to value ratio, 757 FICO score. If you look on this slide, the top line of this shows you the 
national FICO distribution. And you can see it's pretty broad. And as you look line by line down this chart, what I've got is the FICO distribution for the GSEs year by year. And what you see is a continual shift over to the right toward ever higher FICO scores. And that shift has been particularly pronounced in the 2009, 2010, 2011 period. So the question is not how is the question then is, how is anyone qualifying for a loan at today's tight standards? And the answer is that FHA is actually, FHA and VA, but particularly FHA is playing a huge, mar is playing a huge role. If you look at the top right slide here, this shows you the Ginnie Mae share of total agency volume. Now, Ginnie Mae is FHA plus VA loans. So what we're looking at is FHA plus VA loans divided by FHA, VA, Fannie, and Freddie. You can see that FHA plus VA loans, that is Ginnie Mae loans, are about 25% of total agency volume. If you look at the top left, you can see there are over 50% of purchase volume, and there are about 15% of refi volume in the bottom left. So the result is that for Ginny May, purchase activity is about half of their total activity. For Fannie and Freddie, um, purchase activity is 10 to 20% of their total activity. So credit availability is very, very tight. So let's sort of take a step back and think about ways to fix this housing crisis. First, we can make credit more available, but um, every single measure that is being talked about in Washington, in fact, goes the other direction. That is, you know, credit was way too available in the 2005 to 2007 period. So every single um, piece of, le every, so you, you've got a lot of, um, out, sort of spawns of legislation out of Dodd, out of the Dodd Frank, such as qualified mortgage and qualified residential mortgage, that will make credit even tighter than it already is. And there seems to be no appetite to make a lo make a loan to a guy that defaulted on his mortgage last week. And besides, he probably can't come up with a down payment on a new mortgage. So one solution here is greater reliance on investors. And I'm going to make you the case that there is a, that there is a huge role for investors in this market. And it's not the panacea, because in fact, there is no silver bullet, but certainly it helps. If you look at the bottom part of this slide, this shows you home ownership rate in the U.S. has gone from 69 to 66 percent as we've already discussed. If you factor in the 2.8 million borrowers who haven't made a payment in over a year, the home ownership rate is actually 63.8 percent. As we go from 69 to 66 to 63.8 percent, these borrowers have to live somewhere. They don't, they don't necessarily have to stay in their home, but they're going to have to move into rental housing. Meanwhile, multifamily year-over-year -year rent growth is very robust, as you can see in the top part of the slide, and the multifamily vacancy rate is down dramatically. So what um, I would suggest is there's a huge role for investors to buy up these properties and rent them out. And Fannie Mae has, actu has actually put into place a pilot program. The bids are due in two weeks on this, and we'll see how the first large, large bulk sales program goes. From an investor's point of view, this is a, it's clear that, you know, from a borrower's, from the ex-borrower's point of view, this makes a lot of sense because what you're doing is putting more supply of housing into the rental market, which will help control rent increases. From the investor's point of view, it also makes sense. Remember I told you how tight credit was. So what we've done is we've taken the National Association of Realtors Housing Affordability Index and we've worked it backwards. We've said we're going to allow the median family to put down 25, to spend 25 percent of their income on their first mortgage. They're going to put down 15 percent and they're going to be able to take out a mortgage at the prevailing 30-year mortgage rate. What home price would this support? So that um, dark line is the implied home price that could be supported by this. And you can, and obviously this is a very, very crude calculation, but what's interesting is we've worked it backwards since 1999. And you can see that never has the gap between existing home sales, pr the, the price of existing homes, and the implied home price been so wide. Um, 
you know, it was, there was a gap in between 1999 and 2004. It closed in the 2005, 2006, 2007 period, and now you can see it's never been wider. So um, housing looks very, very affordable, suggesting that if credit standards return to normal, and they will never return to normal, there is some upside for investors. And obviously this overstates the upside, but it does give you an idea that there is some. In addition, other fixed income products have very, very low yields now. So what we've done is we've looked at the um, gross and net spread to swaps that can be obtained using this strategy. And so we define rental income as 33% of gross uh, median income divided by the home sales price. That is sort of like your cap rate, for capitalization rate for this sort of transaction minus your 10-year swap rate. We've shown a gross spread and a net spread. That difference is huge because it's obviously very, very costly to support a single family scattered site rental strategy. As a matter of fact, what we've done here is we've shown you, you know, sort of some representative expenses. So if you have a lower priced home, like a $120,000 home that you're renting for $1,200 a month, the gross cap rate is 12%. By the time you end up subtracting expenses, it's a 6.8%. If you look at a $600,000 home, that $600,000 home is not going to rent for five times what a, the $120,000 home. Um, in this case, we assume it rents for $4,000 or about 3.3 uh, times the lower priced home. That has a gross cap rate of, six, of, of 8% and a net cap rate of 4.2%. Bottom line, this rental strategy works best for lower priced homes. It is not the panacea for the entire market. Now you look at this and you say, well gee, a net cap rate of 6.8% isn't all that great. Why would anyone want to do it? And the answer is, um, 6.8% is not that great, but you've got a couple of sources of upside. You've got the upside that you, um, you, the, the home is going to appreciate at some point, and you have the upside that you're going to be able to raise rents over time. So then the question is, are there enough lower priced homes to make a difference? That is, homes generally under 200,000 work for this type of strategy. And you can see um, here that out of the two point, um, um, you can see here that um, out of the 3.2 million homes in the overall housing market that are um, greater than 12 months delinquent or in foreclosure or REO, 2.4 million are um, zero are in the zero to 200 category. So you've got a huge number of homes in that price range. And even if you assume that the agencies are going to do this for their own portfolio and it won't be done anywhere else, it's still over a million units. So, you know, cleaning up a million units from the current shadow inventory of 3.2 million units would make a huge difference. So we actually are, are very large proponents of the bulk sales program. You look, at the invest you look at the investors that have been involved in this market so far, and they're mom and pop investors. A guy buys two, three, four, ten properties. There has been no... For a large-scale investor, it's very hard to get into the market because you have to ha you have to be able to buy 100 or 200 properties at once to build to build to put into place a large-scale property management company to manage the properties. And the only way you can do that is through is by buying a bunch of properties in bulk. Hence the role for the bulk sales program. It'll be very interesting to see how Fannie's auction goes. They've put. Um, eight or ten different groups of properties together representing about 2,500 properties um, that they're auctioning in eight or ten groups on an all or nothing basis. The rules of engagement aren't 100% clear for this. That is, the highest bidder doesn't necessarily win. They're giving credit to things like affordable housing, um, joint ventures, things like that. But, what, you know, it'll be very interesting to see how that goes. But I think it's going to end up trading very, very well. A um, few words on loan modifications. Um, first, modification activity has gone way down. There's lots less loans being modified just because we've gone through the universe of modified loans. However, the types of modifications are becoming much more significant. Many more principal mods. Um, 
where you actually lower the borrower's balance either through forbearance or forgiveness. Um, and Manuel Santos was talking about a forbearance strategy. Um, a lot more rate mods, much fewer capitalization mods where you don't want, where you don't modify either the borrower's rate or the principal amount. You just basically take his delinquent amount, add it to the current, ba add it to the balance, and pronounce him current. So much fewer of those types of mods. The result of that is modification success has improved dramatically through time. And you can see that on this page. Um, I should also mention that the way we measure modification success is we usually look at the loans that are left and say, how many of these guys are 60 days delinquent? In fact, that's a really bad way to look at modification success because if I give someone a modification, they default and I liquidate them. They have failed on that modification and we need to take that into account. Similarly, if I give someone a modification, they fail. I give them another modification and they're paying on that. I want count that as one success and one failure. So we've redone the traditional calculation to do it right on the right hand side of this page. But you can see in any event that modification success has improved dramatically through time. That reflects the fact that we're doing much more significant modifications now. It also reflects the fact that we've changed the way we count. Modifications didn't used to have a trial period. That is, it counted it as a modification the second it was done. Now the borrower has to pay for three months before it becomes a modification. And you can see, you know, sort of in 2008, early 2009, the default rate in the first few months was very, very high. Um, so the fact that we're improving modification success through time is very, very good. And it means that my 7.2 to 9.2 million number may turn out to be a little bit high. And to the extent we can cut that by keeping borrowers in their homes, so much the better. And if you look at the bottom part of this chart on the right-hand side, what this shows is that by far the most effective type of modification is principal mods. Principal mods are much more effective than either rate mod modification or capitalization modifications. And principal mods, as done here, reflects both principal forbearance and principal forgiveness. So, um, you know, again, principal modifications are the most successful type of modification. Um, how am I doing time wise? Five more minutes. Okay. Okay, um, I've been a rather large fan of principal reduction mods through time, and I want to point out a couple things about principal reduction mods. First, banks have historically been doing them for their own portfolios, but not for loans owned by others. If you look at this slide and you look at the left-hand side of the slide, which is the fourth quarter of 2010, you can see that banks basically did principal reduction on 17.8% of their own portfolio loans, 1.8% on loans owned by uh, loans owned by private label investors, and 0% on Fannie, Freddie, and government guaranteed loans. By the fourth quarter of 2011, they were doing principal reduction on 25% of their own portfolio loans, 16% on private investor loans, and 0% on Fannie, Freddie, or government guaranteed loans because they're not allowed to do it on Fannie, Freddie, or government guaranteed loans. Um, and in fact, bank portfolio loans have lower redefault rates than other types of loans. And we think part of that reflects the fact that you're essentially cutting the borrower's principal balance and therefore um, he's less apt to default. So we're huge fans of principal reduction. However, the moral hazard problem does loom very, very large. A um, couple of comments there. First, there is moral hazard under the present program as well. So if you look at this slide, this shows you the default, the rate at which always performing borrowers are going 60 plus for the first time. And we've divided the world into owner-occupied and non-owner-occupied borrowers. When the modification program, which was an interest rate reduction program only to begin with, was first announced, owner-occupants were eligible for the program, non-owner-occupants were not. So basically, it was during a period where the, where the economy was getting much, much worse. But you can see that the transition rates on owner and non-owner occupants, which had been very, very similar, started to diverge very considerably. Owner occupants began to default at a much higher rate than their non-owner occupied counterparts in both prime, both prime securities and for all day securities. The bottom line, 
Borrowers knew that if they went two payments behind, they could get a modification. So owner-occupied borrowers who were eligible for the modification took advantage of this and went two payments behind. Non-owner occupants who were not eligible for this did not. Very simple, people respond to incentives. So then the question is, if you do a principal reduction program, you have to gate it to avoid or to minimize the moral hazard problem, and there are two possible ways to gate it. One way to gate it is to say you have to be delinquent before a certain date or you can't qualify for the program. The other way to gate it is to use a shared appreciation mortgage. So if I offer you, so if I'm a borrower who's at 150 loan to value ratio, and I'm offered a, um, a principal reduction to 115 in exchange for 50% of my upside, I'm apt to think that's a really good deal and take advantage of it, whereas a borrower at 120 loan to value who's making his payments anyway is not going to give up 50% of his upside to be reduced to 115 loan to value. So I do think a shared appreciation mortgage is a, another way, is a way to avoid the moral hazard problem in, in loans with principal um, reduction. Um, right now, again, principal reduction, and I don't think principal reduction should be a required tool, rather it should just be in the toolbox. There are certain borrowers for whom it works better than any other option. There are certain borrowers for whom it doesn't, and just having it in the toolkit is very, very valuable. Certainly it's being used on bank portfolio loans and private label loans. It's not being used in Freddie, Fannie, or government guaranteed loans. I think it's something, there's been a lot of pressure on DeMarco to begin to do some sort of principal reduction on Fannie and Freddie loans. I wouldn't be surprised to see him agree to do that under under a very limited set of circumstances, such as the borrower has to already be delinquent on the loan as of a certain date, and it would be optional. But I would think that that would be a very, very valuable addition to the GSE toolbox. So um, again, we have 7.2 to 9.2 million borrowers left to default. We've liquidated 4.7 million, a huge problem. The two best ways to deal with this problem are first, bulk sales to clear a lot of the inventory, and second, more successful modifications which keep more borrowers in their home. So thank you very much.